<clears throat> okay, hello. Uh, um, first, uh, Happy New Year. Uh, it is uh, the 2nd of January 2023. A new year just started, as you know, and we'll talk about two architects, both Italian and both born on the same day, January 2nd, but a few years apart, not too many um, uh, years apart. We start with Giovanni uh, Michelucci, a remarkable a truly remarkable Italian architect, and then we'll talk to Lui, we'll talk about Luigi Moretti. So Giovanni Michelucci, Italian architect, urban planner and designer, was born in Pistoia, Tuscany, on the 2nd of January 1891, and died on the night of 31st of December 1990, two days before his 100th birthday at his studio home in Fiesole in Florence Hills now the headquarters of his foundation. He had the good fortune to live a long life almost entirely within the span of the 20th century, giving us a valuable witness through his work with innovative architectural vernaculars and proposals from his understanding of the complexity of events, transformations and ideas that animated the 20th century. He was one of the major Italian architects of that century, known for famous projects such as the Firenze Santa Maria Novella railway station and the San Giovanni Battista church on the Autostrada del Sole. And we are going to see uh, both works. Uh, this was the man, probably close to over 90 for sure, uh, remarkably long life, but architects live long lives in general, and particularly at this time, an intense man, and I believe a, uh, a believer because he built several churches, very intense buildings, very interesting buildings. Here he is as a young, uh, younger architect, a young architect surrounded by um, a well-known uh, uh, ambiance or environment for an architect, well, that is before the arrival of the computer. Um, anyway, uh, those, uh, you know, affected by nostalgia would certainly love this, uh, love this picture as I do. Uh, Giovanni Michelucci, a handsome Italian man like most Italian men. So now we look at some of his drawings. He was advocating uh, and, and building uh, an architecture, an organic architecture, uh, in part an expressionist architecture and um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a world dominated still by some kind of cerebralism or, or rationalism, uh, he stands apart. Um, Chiesa dell'Autostrada del Sole, um, the, the very, very important building by him, we are going to, we are going to see it. So these, these are just some drawings of, of, his, uh, uh, of, of his works. This is another church he built, uh, and we are going to see it. As you can see, he has uh, so-called visionary drawings uh, full of, of, of passion, full of emotion, maybe even full of pathos. But pathos, unfortunately, became a word uh, with some pejorative um, connotations, although it shouldn't really. But um, again, in, a, in an age of uh, obsessed by, uh, um, you know, uh, if not reticence, uh, some kind of a rationalism and uh, cerebralism, uh, pathos is seen as, as something negative because, uh, you know, it, from, from pathos to pathetic is a short distance. But, but even uh, Ludwig van Beethoven has a beautiful musical piece, um, Pathetica, which is uh, actually a, a great, a great, um, uh, you know, uh, musical uh, uh, expression of, 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 of pathos, meaning of passion. But we see a lot of passion in the work of this Italian architect who built uh, beautifully. And um, he built many buildings and we are going to see lesser known buildings as well. But now still these drawings for, um, uh, Chiesa dell'Autostrada del Sole is uh, still uh, taking a lot of space. 
of my presentation. But he did all kinds of, of studies, and you can see this is not a typical architect's drawing. But um, I think we need more and more atypical architects in the world if we, if we are to avoid uh, becoming immensely bored, if not worse, uh, indifferent and even cynical. We start with this work from 1935. So he was over 40 at the time. Uh, he was part of a team and uh, it might be that um, he, he was the leader of the team, I don't know. This is the railway station in Florence in Italy across the street from uh, a famous work by where Alberti himself was involved, the facade of Santa Maria Novella. Um, anyway, this is a thoroughly modern building, a railway station uh, being built before the Second World War and is still uh, remarkably, I would say fresh and, and, and modern, modernistic. And this is how the railway station of Florence looks like right now. I mean, this is an old picture, but it looks the same. Uh, Giovanni uh, Michelucci, uh, working uh, with a group of architects. Uh, and uh, again, I think it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very good work, but he changed from this work at that time, he, he developed uh, his private, so-called private, uh, vision of, um, of uh, doing architecture and we are, we'll arrive at that. This is how the building of the railway station looks like now. So if you arrive in Florence by train from the airport or from wherever, uh, you'll, uh, you'll uh, arrive at this building. And as I said, across the street, the Santa Maria Novella with a beautiful facade built by Leon Battista Alberti, the great great Renaissance master. Arezzo Palazzo del Governo, 1936. Yeah, as you can see, as, as other Italian men, other, other Italian architects, he was um, you know, heavily influenced by, by the culture of his country and maybe particularly the country of Flor the, the, uh, you know, the city of, of Florence uh, itself. But uh, here we still see historicism. This is a historicist building, but we'll see soon how he evolved from this, uh, who, he emancipated himself from the, from the burden actually of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, significant history. But even this is uh, an interesting building, I would say, despite the fact that it is, you know, uh, literally uh, historicist, I still think it has it has a, 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 some originality and even some modernity. Plus, it's a governmental building, so here he couldn't be, you know, an expressionist or an organic architect as he was in some uh, famous churches he built later. Il Palazzo del Governo di Arezzo. Giovanni Michelucci, di Giovanni Michelucci, Arezzo, Palazzo del Genio, Genio Civile, 1938, another building before the Second World War by um, Giovanni Michelucci. Again, this man lived 100 years minus two days. He died on the 31st of December uh, and he, 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 no, he died on the, yeah, he died on the 31st of December and he, was born on the 2nd of, of January. But again, these buildings are not, they don't announce in any way what was to come. He was still, uh, you know, reticent to leave the, to leave, uh, you know, a certain tradition, but uh, will arrive very soon at something else. Now, this is a church, a first church from 1953, <clears throat> so after the Second World War, it's a small church, a rural church, perhaps, but I, 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 I still think it has qualities. It's, it's uh, you know, it has, it's, it's a sober building, uh, which is adequate for a church, but uh, it's in no way, uh, you know, a, a, a frigid building. And, uh, you know, in this uh, composite picture with a trunk of a tree and the building behind, 
you can see that uh, maybe some dialogue could be could be uh, arrived at. Uh, the plan is uh, almost a, a cross, as you can see, with some additional spaces left and right. Again, you know, he was a very complex man. You know, he didn't start his freedom uh, uh, very quickly. But, but even these early, earlier works, I think, well, he was already over 55 when he built this building. But I, I, I like this building, you know, in its uh, modesty, it has integrity and uh, I, I love the tectonics. It, it's, it's the kind of building one can trust. Now the boards are bull, the, 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 you know, the um, financial building, uh, Bursa in Romanian in Pistoia, 1950, even this one is interesting, you know. I, I, again, it's 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 uh, not a building that is flamboyant in any way, but I think it's done very well, and uh, maybe with a sense of uh, reticence that uh, maybe the exaltations some people find in money um, would uh, would be false to think twice, so to speak. That is, if money thinks at, thinks at all, which probably they don't. But we think a lot of them and in their place. Now, this is how the building looks like now. Uh, it, it, it was modified here and there. There were some interventions. I don't know if he was the author of these changes or not. Um, but you see, he was not afraid also of um, you know, provoking the older buildings like the one on the right with uh, elements of novelty. Pistoia. Now, Firenze Ponte alla Grazie, uh, um, uh, a bridge from 1954. Uh, I don't know what happened with the previous, with the older bridge. Maybe, I don't know, during the war or, or some kind of um, natural disaster occurred. But this, this bridge shows, uh, again, his uh, seriousness and his uh, sensitivity, uh, even to uh, what is rather an engineering work. You see here Brunelleschi's dome, because we are indeed in Florence. Uh, and the building does have elements of modernity. Giovanni Michelucci, the bridge alla grazie, Giovanni Michelucci. Uh, sorry about the resolution here. So here you see the old building having uh, even, um, you know, buildings on top of the bridge. But I don't know what happened to, I have to read, I didn't. I don't know what happened to the old bridge. Anyway, now we see another chiesa, another church. Very interesting, this one as well. I do believe, like many Italians, he was a believer. He had faith and, and because he built many churches. And I don't think he had to be persuaded by an eccentric uh, uh, monk, uh, lover of modern art, uh, like Le Corbusier was, to accept the commission for uh, Ronchamp and uh, La Tourette and maybe even St. Pierre. Uh, Saint, Saint, um, uh, what's the third church by uh, Le Corbusier in Firmini Vere, San Pietro. Uh, this one by, uh, by Michelucci from 1956, Pistoia, Chiesa la Santa, Santa Maria e Tecla. Again, a building which is not expressionist, which is not organic, but I, I, I admire it. Um, uh, I almost used an inappropriate word vehemently, especially the interior is, is very moving. And it reminds me actually of the church at La Tourette by Le Corbusier, because this is a, the nave of the church. It's just a prism, no, a rectangular prism. But, but the inside, I didn't visit it, but from the picture seems to be very well done. Um, But even towards the outside, it has an austerity um, that, that, that I think is appropriate for a, for a church. 
and the inside uh, the, I mean look at the structure of the of, of the of the roof uh, it's the it's where he asserts a certain modernity and it is a clarity of thought but there is also in the fragmentation of the geometry he uses uh, there is some kind of um, sculpturalness uh, I wish I had more pictures anyway there are imperfections in these uh, presentations but at the end of the day so to speak you'll have a, 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 large, a comprehensive a comprehensive understanding of Giovanni Michelucci Firenze Casa in Via della Sprone is a block of flats in Florence it's very difficult to build in Florence because you know the weight of history is uh, an art is very very um, uh, unavoidable and uh, you know probably there are also restrictions of all of all sorts anyway but even here you know it's not a banal building with this uh, you know uh, top uh, part of the building uh, maybe a reference to a certain tradition and yet what is underneath uh, it's uh, the language of modernity an apartment building in florence As we can see, he used also exterior corridor to access um, the apartments. And this I always advocate because I, I think it's, if this is used, you can give a cross ventilation for the apartments. It's very easy to, to organize the apartments properly because of this double orientation. It's not very used this uh, principle in, in, in Romania, but uh, that's a rather unfortunate thing. La Chiesina, this is a, a, a little church, uh, very, I almost said delicious, a delicious church. Uh, sorry about the language, uh, maybe we should never say something like this, but then why not? It is delicious in the sense that it's a small jewel, uh, it's a small building uh, that, that sits very well where it was built, and uh, you know, the, the, the usage of, 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 of stone and uh, ceramic tiles on the roof uh, creates a, you know, a building which does not insult the trees around. And also perhaps the, the beautiful light that uh, we can imagine this place has. And we can even see here, uh, you know, uh, contemplating the grass and the shadows of the trees. It's, it's a small building, very small building, but um, it's done uh, romantically, uh, sensitively, and mainly because of the, well, the geometry is very simple, but the materials he used are um, inducive to, um, you know, a romantic state of mind, so to speak. A modest building, yes. Giovanni Michelucci. Uh, what is this? Uh, another chiesa. Um, I even forgot about this building. He really built a lot of, uh, well, a lot, uh, quite a number of churches. And you see the same reticence, which he gives up actually a little later. But here he is still, uh, uh, you know, almost melancholy in using uh, geometry and the rhythm of, uh, you know, equidistant elements. Uh, it shows that he was not a radical soul um, at the beginning, but later, including a bank he built, and is one of the last buildings I will show, you will see that he changed. But I like this period in his work as well. It, it's not divorced from what we call tradition, it's not divorced from what we call the past, and yet he asserts himself in uh, you can see the interior and i am very sorry for mr peter Zumtor, but i cannot compare this building with a very celebrated little chapel that peter Zumtor built this is a, this is a higher level of architecture not just in terms of um, dimensions but mainly in terms of quality and complexity i think you know what uh, chapel i'm referring to uh, anyway um Giovanni Michelucci, another church. I'm 
I like this picture very much in, in black and white as it is. And our building in, no, it's not in Pistoia, let's see, in Livorno, uh, a skyscraper. In fact, uh, I was very, very surprised to discover that this architect, let's see, when was he, in 1966, built in Livorno, uh, you know, a city I didn't even know anything about, built this very tall building, which could have been, you know, the pride of Frankfurt and mine, or, uh, I don't know, uh, Barcelona or who knows what. And it's a good building. It's, 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 it's a good building you wouldn't expect after the reticence in this church building to have this architect um, create such a tall building in, 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 in Livorno. Grata Cielo, <laughs> skyscraper, Piazza Matteotti. In colors, it looks a little bit different. I like it more in black and white, but tall it is indeed. Very interesting architect, you know. So he assumed the sacred and the profane. Now we are looking at the profane. Again, I, I, I like it more in black and white, but uh, I guess in colors it's okay too, especially if it's treated with Photoshop as probably it is in this unless this is some kind of a rendering, which could be the case too. Sketches, where you see the emotion of the draftsman, the emotion of the architect. Giovanni Michelucci, uh, what is this? Another Chiesa, Chiesa del Sacro. This is also a very interesting building, and you see he is beginning to show signs of impatience towards tradition and become more innovative. You enter this building through the corner at the very edge of the building, and it's here where it, 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 the window becomes special, and also the ceiling, the roofing. Uh, we'll see the, the picture, you see, from the outside. Is a good, very good manipulator of stone of, or you know natural materials, and the exceptionalism of the house of God, because that's what the church is, is shown here in the corner, you know, where he uh, contorts in a way uh, the, the the elevation and the window, and uh, even the way he 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 creates this uh, dynamic. Uh, it's almost like an artwork with an X, which is, um, you know, uh, the derivation of the cross. Let's hope I have an, a, another image of it um, from the outside. Yeah, here we can see. You see, he he he's able to to through an, the abstract language of architecture to evoke that question mark or that. Uh, the, 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 you know, the, the, the exceptionalism of what the house of God is, you know, because if you see this, this building from the outside, maybe without having any training in architecture or theology, you kind of feel that this might be a church, although you don't see a, a cross per se, it's not explicitly a church, but implicitly, implicitly it is. And this is uh, not an easy thing to do. And it's also inside, it's structure, but it's structure with emotion, it's structure with, a, with, a, with an expression, an architectural expression. And um, again, this is not easy to do, but uh, we are going to see even more courageous gestures in this sense very soon. Giovanni Michelucci, an excellent architect. was blessed to live 100 years without two days. I guess God loved him too. What else can we say? But God loves um, architects in general because architects live long lives, especially these days. There are quite a number of architects over 90. I keep saying it. Look at this. Um, well, I only see a fragment of the wooden door, but uh, here is the art of the architect as well. And you see the, you know, the stone wall, uh, stone loves wood, wood loves stone, and, 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 and he treats them differently. 
as, as, as they are supposed to be treated differently. A good lesson in, in, in the tectonics uh, of, uh, of architecture as is the structure inside as well. Uh, another Chiesa del Cimiterio, uh, Cimiterio. This is a different building. It's, uh, it's uh, incorporated in the, in the existing cemetery in Pistoia. This one doesn't impress me so much, maybe because of its symmetry, but uh, who knows? Maybe, I mean, inside is still very interesting, I think, with its uh, assumed modernity and uh, then the, the, the stained glass window, which is large and narrative. So there are maybe, you know, Kenneth Frampton said that Carlos Carpa uh, tried intensely not to divorce himself from, from tradition. Well, I don't know if the same thing can be said about Giovanni Michelucci, but you see that his architecture is continues some kind of a dialogue with a certain kind of past, at least in the works we saw until now. Although here we see a structure which is in no, in no way we can tell, we can call traditional. And even the stained glass work which was probably done by an artist or a group of artists, um, even, even this has a, you know, a certain modernity. Otherwise, from the outside, the building, uh, unfortunately, I think, uh, announces uh, you know, similar gestures, architectural gestures from postmodernism. Chiesa San Giovanni Battista, this is his most famous work from 1964, so from um, almost 60 years ago, uh, Chiesa della Autostrada, because, well, I saw it myself from a bus. I couldn't stop. I couldn't tell the driver to stop, the, although I, I was tempted to. Uh, I didn't visit it, but I saw it from, the, from a bus, which was taking me away from Florence. Uh, a very important work, 1964. Um, and we see now uh, the fully mature and uh, iconoclastic, uh, almost rebellious uh, uh, church architect. Uh, these are the, the drawings with the, the elevations and the sections and the plans of this uh, Chiesa dell'Autostrada, um, uh, not too far away from Florence, but outside the Florence a sketch, a preliminary sketch, and what you see is what you get, because he built it very much in the spirit of this sketch, and now images from the inside and outside. I mean, it's a lesson in, in, uh, in uh, an architecture of passion, I think, and an organic architecture, which is so very different, actually, from the architecture of Frank Lloyd Wright, who was, a, you know, famously uh, promoting organic architecture. But here, the, you know, the movement of the building is, uh, is uh, an essay in, in, in architectural lyricism. And yet he, he, is, not, he is not ignoring the, the value of tactility and the value of tectonics. The interior is very impressive as far as I can judge it from these photographs. I mean, you have the forest of columns, it is concrete and the ir irrational is assumed, uh, you know, the unconscious, and we can only be glad that he assumed it because after all, is God something knowable? No, it's the unknown par excellence. So this structure in its apparent irrationality is a metaphor for an unknowable God, I think. But it, it, it's a magnificent work. If, if, peop, if someone loves passion in architecture, it, it's impossible not to love this work. Uh, this was done before the, the arrival of the, of the digital uh, you know, field in architecture. And you know, it was done. This picture is actually taken from a bus. You see, I didn't take it, although I did take some pictures, but they are not in this presentation. But you see in the window, the, the reflection structure. 
like a, a modernistic Gothicism, a Gothic modern architecture. The nave, which is a womb, the sacred womb, which was probably the original vision of, a, of, of, of the nave of a church. And then the aspiration towards the above or the below, but it is in this case the above, you know, for light, but then there are shadows. You know, the, it expresses, I think, a desire for faith, if not faith per se, a desire for faith. It's a good building. Now, why this architect is not taught in the schools of architecture, I do not know. He also should have received the Pritzker Prize, but he didn't. Instead, someone like Kevin Roach, received it, who was, uh, in my opinion, uh, not a better architect than Michelucci. But uh, there are here contortions, which, uh, you know, more timid souls would say, well, we cannot uh, show the drama of the human soul in a building dedicated to God, why not? You know, this building reiterates something that I, I keep thinking and keep feeling and keep saying. Architecture is beautiful if it is creative. If it is not creative, it's less beautiful. And uh, might not even be very pleasant to practice. But if it is creative, then yes, it's worth any sacrifice. And who makes it creative? The architect, who else? We cannot blame the clients for the mediocrity of our architecture. No, we can only blame ourselves. Nobody, nobody can, can stop you from being creative if you are totally in love with architecture as you are supposed to be. Uh, uh, otherwise, why would you practice architecture? It has to, it, it has to be based on love. And the wonderment like a child in front of the mysteries of life and the mysteries of, you know, the spiritual life as well, like in the case of a church. Now we arrive at something else, which is a restaurant from, from a church to a restaurant. It's a long distance in terms of function now, but he used here to I'm not very fond of this, uh, but he tried to make something interesting even within uh, the prose of, of this function, a, a, a restaurant. I don't know. I, um, I mean, why shouldn't a restaurant also be interesting? Uh, yeah, ideally it should be, perhaps. Anyway, it's, 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 it is what it is. And the, the owners of the restaurant <laughs> added, I'm sure this was not... Uh, the decision of uh, Giovanni Michelucci to, to place those, uh, uh, you know, artworks there, let's call them so. But the structure of the building is, is still uh, Giovanni Michelucci. And uh, even more so in the black and white pictures, I would think. And the power of the diagonal. Uh, I am going to invite you on, on the 26th of February to have a festival of the di diagonal as an homage to Claude Parron, the important French architect who, who um, was born 100 years ago. I already wrote today to Jean Nouvel. I don't know if, if the message will arrive to him, asking him to, to join us because he was the, you know, a good friend of Claude Parron and uh, 
you know, Claude Parent was his mentor. He worked in the office of Claude Parent. They were very affectionate towards each other. And it's an occasion, it's the centenary. And he was the great promoter of the, of the oblique plane, the, the diagonal in architecture. And what else do we see here? We see the diagonals of the structure that Giovanni Michelucci used. And the diagonal always saves the show, so to speak, because the diagonal uh, brings drama uh, to, to, to a building. And we need, I think, a little bit of drama. This work is a little, I'm not sure what he did for some fallen, uh, some fallen uh, soldiers, um, I think in Africa or somewhere, he built a, a chapel in 1963. It doesn't look so impressive from the outside, but inside has some interesting uh, things going on. Uh, like here again, the, this, uh, this structure I think is, is uh, impressive because it looks industrial, but the function of the building is a chapel. I don't know enough about this work, maybe because I didn't like it so much, although I do like the, the, the structure. And indeed, he is very good, Giovanni Michelucci, at dramatizing at least parts of the structure that, that support, uh, support the building, like here. But the outside, uh, in my opinion, is not very convincing. I don't even know if he designed the whole building or not. I don't know about that uh, Persian rug, but anyway, uh, people use all kinds of things. <clears throat> they use Persian rugs even in the buildings by Jean, by, by uh, Louis Kahn, maybe in order to soften a little bit the uh, rather rough, um, you know, uh, exposed concrete work. Uh, anyway, um, so it's a chapel by Giovanni Michelucci. As I said, I go a little bit quick, quickly because I need to finish by 7.30. Uh, another uh, church, Santuario della Beata Vergine della, della Consolazione, 1967, another re remarkable building by Giovanni Michelucci, uh, <clears throat> quite sculptural and uh, dramatic. And it doesn't bother me at all that the finishes of the exterior are affected by the elements. It's okay. It's the passage of time. The interior also has very interesting ways in which the, the light enters the building. Uh, it's maybe a little bit less dramatic than the previous, than the church of the, of the, of the highway um, that we saw before, but maybe on the other hand, it's even more dramatic. Interesting work. Uh, and this one again near the highway, just like the other one. He, this was uh, his luck. Well, I am sarcastic a little bit to build churches in, in such a proximity to the highways. But look at this interior, you know, it's like almost Rudolf Steiner or uh, Hans Pelzig or some kind of a. Yeah, it, it's, it's really remarkable what he did. Then look at this, it's alchemy. It's, it's transformation through light and through these, these fluidities. And again, he worked here before the arrival of parametric design. Uh, oh, by the way, of parametric design, the next architect we'll talk about, uh, Luigi Moretti, apparently he's considered the father of parametrices, believe it or not. But, but, but this before the arrival of, of, of uh, you know, our digital age or parat parametrices per se. Anyway, we'll arrive at Luigi Moretti in, uh, in a few minutes. So again, another remarkable church by, by uh, uh, this, um, this um, you know, uh, Italian uh, Giovanni Michelucci who built another church and we are going to see it uh, near Vicenza. The building, the city dominated by the genius of Andrea Palladio. Again and again, architecture is so beautiful when it is creative, and it has to be creative, and it, it can only be creative if it approaches the unknown or attempts to approach the unknown. Like here, you know, it's mystery. It's mystery, the play between light and shadow. 
and the, you know, the manipulation of geometry in a certain way. Why did he complicate himself? Well, this is a nonsense question, you know. It's because he had the soul of an artist, that's why. How else are you supposed to arrive at poetry? Look how magnificently the sunset touches, the sunset light touches the top of the roof of this church. It, 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 it becomes inflamed. Maybe he did it intentionally, I don't know. They're exactly there in a certain conditions of light, the building becomes fire or fire, fired up or fiery. I think we see nothing else in these buildings but the human soul with its uh, longing for certitudes, with its doubts, with its shadows, with its light. Another church, 1967, San Giovanni Battista, Chiesa di San Giovanni Battista. Um, this one is near Vicenza. Uh, this one is interesting too. Of course, the building of a church has to be exalted and exalting. It has to. And if it fails to be so, it doesn't deserve to be a, you know, a church architecture. Because essentially, this is what it is, a church, the house of God. Another church, 1966, very different from the previous ones. This one, in my opinion, has a problem, but I don't know. I didn't experience it, you know, in person. I didn't travel there to see it. But he created an outdoor amphitheater on top of the church. And he paid the price for this, but from this uh, view, point of view, it looks uh, fine, it looks convincing. But you'll see the ceiling is rather low because on top of the building, he created an amphitheater. Uh, you see a little bit here, um, you see in the plan too. Um, the plan is, is, is again, it's, it's, it's a womb, it's a sacred womb and it's fine like this, but um, I still think the ceiling inside the church is a little bit low, a little bit pressing on top of this otherwise great assembly hall or gathering, gathering room. I like very much the drawings, you know, the, the first intuitions of the architect, as you can see here. As long as you don't I hope I have here some pictures with a section so you, 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 you'll understand what I try to say. Like you see here, he's depressing, he's depressing the ceiling exactly in the center of the room in order to accommodate uh, an uh, outdoor amphitheater above. And uh, I don't know, this is, uh, but I don't know, maybe the experience inside the building is, 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 is convincing and correct. I, I maybe I have a conventional way of thinking. I, I like to think that in the center of a church, somehow the space should grow here, not become lower in height. But I, I don't know. It's probably the only church in the world which has an amphitheater, an outdoor amphitheater on top of the church. Otherwise, the building is quite interesting, as you, we can see even from this picture. It's, uh, it's visceral, it's, um, it's like a vortex. 
a very creative architect and he 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 changed all the time Giovanni Michelucci, a lot of concrete, yes. Well, today, these days, we should abstain from using a lot of concrete because, you know, it pollutes. You see here, I guess what I try to say that somehow it pays the price for trying to create that amphitheater above the church itself. Um, and the ceiling is too flat. Here he is probably over 90 or maybe even over 95. You see the expression of the workers there, who, whoever the man behind him is, you know, they have this respect for the older architect who created so much for the architecture of Italy. Bravo to him and bravo to them as well. You know, now some other photographs uh, with him. I don't know why I incorporated them here. We already saw this picture and I like this picture very much. Um, I like also this picture of this solitary man, an introverted man, an introverted architect, and his beautiful hand, aged almost 100 years, you know, um, the hand of the architect, and some of his drawings. I once wrote a little poem, a very short poem, kind of a haiku. The hands know what women know, what men and words try to know. Which, uh, so uh, I, I believe the hand has its own intelligence. If you allow it to, to, to act, uh, you know, naturally, unrestricted by uh, disturbing uh, brain, um, you know, <laughs> impulses so to speak just allow the hand to to do its work uh, and uh, I, I think it has its own intelligence but i was accused of sexism because i said in the united states they some some people some students accused me of sexism how could i say that the hands know what women know what men and words try to know uh, it was actually an homage to women because i think women have a more subtle intelligence than men, you know, because men are devoured by um, excessive reason, but the, but the instincts, uh, the intuitions of, uh, 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 of a woman, which I approximate, it might be also the intuitions and the instincts of a hand. And it was my opinion then when I wrote these four lines that, uh, you know, the hands know what women know, what men and words try to know, because men try to know, but do they succeed? I don't know. I should talk about myself. Anyway, interesting architect Giovanni Michelucci, and as a young man, uh, as I said, uh, handsome, as most Italian men are, and in older age too, but you can tell he was an introverted man, a solitary man, a poet in architecture, furniture designs, uh, he designed a lot of furniture as well. Uh, so an architect doesn't do just the exterior of a building, you know, it does everything. Uh, urbanism, interior, the interior of the building, furniture, and even object designs. But uh, other buildings will, will, will follow uh, because the, the, the presentation will not end with this furniture. This is a long presentation, maybe a little bit too long for someone who needs to live in one hour and a half. But uh, uh, forgive me if I go a little bit quickly, but that's the reason why. I like his chairs too. They might not be very comfortable, but uh, this is known. You know, architects don't build, uh, don't always build comfortable chairs. Uh, Ospedale di Sarzana, 1967, uh, hospital.
an unusually looking uh, hospital, uh, if you ask me. Another chapel in Firenze, 1970, a little chapel. Now this work, which I admire a lot, I don't usually admire banks because I hate money and money hates me in return, but this bank is beautiful uh, by uh, this very interesting architect. Look at the drawing and you'll see it, uh, you know, the, the, the way he manipulates the steel structure is astonishing and it's also red, he paints the steel in red. So it's, a, it's the most joyous bank I ever saw, look at it. I mean, maybe the word joyous is not totally, you know, uh, uh, the most appropriate word. I don't know, but I, I like the, the building very much, so much so that I forget it's a bank. I don't know if he built also, I guess this the stone uh, building in the corner is an existing building, and then he just built a new apartment. But how many banks in the world look like this? Of course, he used a lot of steel here, and you wonder why. But uh, maybe, maybe you know, this is the exaltation, uh, the red exaltation of someone who got a good loan, you know, and was in great need, and the bank was generous. I guess architecture could change one's life, you know, um, whatever the skepticism of. Uh, uh, Peter Sumtor, as you can see, I have something against Peter Sumtor. It's true, I do. Uh, but I like this building by Giovanni Michelucci. Uh, if I lived in uh, Italy and in this place, I probably would uh, would uh, enjoy uh, connecting with this bank just because of the the unusual architecture. And you see here, uh, harmony through contrast, the old stone building and the new steel structure by Giovanni Michelucci uh, bringing in the new and being unafraid to marry, you know, uh, an expression is the expressionism of steel with uh, uh, masonry of stone. Beautiful details as well. It's possible that even Sir Richard Rogers would have loved this building. It's architecture. It is architecture. It's as simple as this. It's architecture with the Gothic longing, Gothic even in the field of a, you know, a bank, the architecture of a bank. But this is assuming modernity and also um, you know, uh, having some kind of, uh, I use the word exaltation, maybe it's not the most inappropriate. The exaltation that uh, maybe comes from faith, from, the, from, uh, from uh, trying to transcend uh, the very function of the building through expressiveness. Oh, the functionalists might say, wait a minute, a lot of steel was used here unnecessary. Well, I don't know. If beauty is unnecessary, then yes. But is it unnecessary? I don't think so. Who knows what metaphors he worked with here. And you see, it's not a glorious context. Across the street, you know, uh, hanged uh, clothes uh, for drying uh, the windows and it's probably a modest little street but the building all of a sudden makes you say wow Firenze Limonaia di Villa Strozzi 1998 needs a work well he was already very old here <clears throat> and he worked uh, with an existing building and he I don't know what and to, to what extent he was uh, uh, involved with just some, uh, you know, refurbishments of some details of, you know, the proximity of existing uh, architectural things. He didn't build this building, just uh, insertions of some modernity. Uh, Museo de la Contrada is 1975. Um, this is uh, 1975, yeah. Um, 
Anyway, I should have stopped a little earlier, but uh, now I go all the way through it because uh, that's what it is. Giovanni Michelucci, La Sede de la Contrada, um, another hybrid context where he had some modernistic interventions, but hard to see. Another Chiesa, this one, uh, 1998, he already, if he didn't die, I forgot in what year he died, but uh, here you can see it's not the same intensity and it's not the same creativity. I'm sure he worked with some people. I'm not trying to excuse him, but this work is not as interesting as, as those he built until the 1970s. This one to all the way to 1998. Anyway, I don't insist. You see, even the cross here, it's so placid. It's not him. Uh, what is this? Uh, he worked with this Bruno Sacchi in 1978. Um, of course, in Italy, you know, it doesn't matter where you build. Uh, the, some interesting buildings show up, like here. And, uh, OK, Olbia Teatro Michelucci, con Luca Emanuele e Corrado Marchetti, 1999. 1990 uh, is not him any longer here. Sorry, I mean, when you live for so long, it's hard, I guess. Anyway, some people took over, in my opinion. He, he, he was some kind of a consultant, maybe, but it's not him. This is not Michelucci. It's not the Michelucci I like to remember. That's why I go quickly. And now Firenze, Giardino del Incontri. This is, I think, where his foundation is now after he died based on his sketch, but I think it was built after he died, you see, until 2007, that these uh, structures, the tree-like uh, vertical supports are literally um, too literal and too uh, figurative in a way. That's not him. He abstracted, yes, he's this uh, trembling, uh, this sketch done with a trembling line seemed to suggest something like this. But um, as we saw earlier, he used the, the, the abstract language of architecture and, and, and it, 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 the, the aspect was not so literal as it is here. I, I, I don't think he saw this. I, I like to imagine that if he saw it, he would have um, changed it in a certain way. Anyway, people gather because he was a famous architect and he, he gave Italy so much. And uh, I'm glad we had the occasion to present his work. Even if, uh, if I end this presentation with a building which was based on his sketch, but uh, that was about it. Fondazione Giovanni Michelucci, 2016. And the sketch, the sketch that he did, but I'm sure if he was younger and he was alive, the building would have looked different. Some books, many books published on him and by him too. I don't know if by him, on him. And now we go to the second architect and sorry for being a little bit in a hurry. I have half an hour to talk about Luigi Moretti, a really important architect who died though younger, much younger than, uh, than um, Giovanni Michelucci. Luigi Moretti, 1907-1973, so he died at 65. So Luigi Walter Moretti was an Italian architect, active especially in Italy since the 30s. He designed buildings such as the uh, Watergate um, complex in Washington, D.C., the Academy of Fencing and Il Girasole, the Sunflower House, both in Rome. He was the founder of the Institute for Operations Research and Applied Mathematics Urbanism, where he developed his research on the history of architecture and on the application of algorithmic methods to architectural design, although he died in 1973, you see. He is recognized as the inventor of parametric architecture. So again, Luigi Moretti, who apparently had some family member or some connection with Belgium, uh, he uh, was born on this day, the 2nd of January, but although he died in 1973, he is considered the inventor of parametric architecture, or one of them, I don't know. That's what I took from Wikipedia. But let's see what he did. 
a very interesting man, and, and this is a very interesting picture as well, because, because it shows an architect who is uh, uh, intelligent. You can see his intelligence on his face, who was also an art, uh, very interested in art. He collected art. And perhaps also uh, uh, like uh, like uh, Michelucci uh, uh, before him, uh, you know, uh, a believer. Uh, uh, we see examples of he's surrounded by art, and then we see the tracing paper in front. And let's see, 1933, Casa del Gil, Quartiere Trastevere, Roma, 1933. Uh, when was he born? in uh, 1907, so he was 26 years old when he built this house. Uh, not bad, 1933, uh, while well, some Italian rationalism here, the neglect over time, this happens. Italy has so many great buildings that, uh, you know, they can't keep up with uh, restoring all of them, or maybe it's the, just their romantic approach to, to life. Uh, and art alike, um, a great uh, helicoidal uh, staircase, uh, stair, um, which is uh, quite uh, animating uh, the space we look at here. The building otherwise towards the exterior is less expressive, this one, than, than the works by uh, Giovanni Michelucci, but still, a different architect altogether. Luigi Moretti, although he was born on the same day, I mean, different years, but the 2nd of January, um, this kind of architecture would not have come uh, easily from uh, just from Giovanni Michelucci, but it did, uh, it did uh, mean something for the Italian culture in general. Italians do have a rationalist movement that is very strong and um, Although Luigi Moretti is more complicated, it's not just rationalist here. Although this building, you know, in particular, might appear to be so, but it has a genuine monumentality. And uh, study carefully, you can discover interesting, uh, value, val valid, valid things, architecturally speaking. A different kind of creativity compared to Giovanni Michelucci's, but still uh, an important, uh, you know, moment in, in in the history of modern architecture in in Italy. Luigi Moretti, Casa Balila, Experimentale, Experimental House, 1933-1937, so before the Second World War. Quite a big building if, if it was just a house. This, these are important architects. You know, we know of uh, the Barcelona Pavilion by Miss van der Rohe, but, uh, you know, <laughs> there were many other architects uh, and perhaps not inferior to Miss that we don't talk about at all. He was a very subtle um, uh, designer, you know, as opposed to Michelucci, who was more interested in, uh, um, you know, organic expression and, uh, you know, the exaltation of form. Here we see subtleties of, uh, of design, 
So he was somewhere in between a designer and an architect. Very well crafted and very finely designed. As you know, as we know, Italians uh, excel in, in, in design methods. And here we see the structure that is done so elegantly for this sports arena. That's what it is. Maybe it's a, f a fencing school in this building. Uh, neglect, but uh, then they restored it. Anyway. Giardini Alforo Mussolini, 1941. Uh, was he involved with the, with the fascists? Maybe he was. I didn't know, I don't know, but uh, this picture shows <laughs> Uh, clear involvement. Uh, many very important Italian architects uh, sympathized, or maybe they didn't have a choice. I don't know. I don't know. But you see, the architecture is uh, ideologically touched, so to speak. Mussolini fonda il popolo d'Italia. Yeah, they, they, this is fascist architecture. But the, the fascism of Italy was so very different from the one in Germany. Albert Speer was a very different architect from the Italians. The Italians used modernity very, very convincingly at times to, to serve their ideology. Sanctuary on Tiberias Lake, Palestine, 1967. Luigi Moretti. Uh, it's just a project, but very futuristic, as you can see. Uh, it was not built. This is beautiful about architecture. If you don't have commissions, you can very well do competitions. You can uh, invent your own programs. You can do uh, buildings nobody asked you for. You can model them. You can draw them. You know, if you love architecture. Another. This is an important house. Uh, building by him from 1948, so after the war, in the histories of modern architecture, very often this building is shown. You know, it's an apartment building in Rome, Casa Il Girasole, Viale Bruno Buozzi, Roma, from 1948. Um, it's very, very subtly and very, very, very uh, uh, interestingly done. As one architectural scholar described it, Luigi Moretti's 1950 Casa Il Girasole is a bit of madness on the solidity of Roman walls. Yet this clever apartment building in the heart of Rome is far from the work of a madman. Its subtle historical allusions and deliberately ambiguous composition betray the genius of the architect's creative and analytical mind. Moretti, whose notable commissions include Villa La Saracena, 1957, Montreal Stock Exchange Tower, 1964, and the Watergate Complex, 1971, from, um, from the United States, achieves a complexity of form and materiality in Il Girasole that distinguishes the project from its mid-century contemporaries and earned uh, recognition um, as one of the earliest forerunners of postmodern design. El Gir Girasole, which translates the sunflower, receives its name from the way the building seems to free itself from contextual constraints to redefine its relationship with the environment. Notably, the site profiles theatrically fan outward to maximize the solar exposure 
like a flower rotating to follow the sun. In the front, an incision cut into the facade appears to split the building in two, spilling light into the inside of the building and illuminating the main entry sequence. Adding to the creative manipulations of the profile, Moretti thinly extends the surface of the front and back facades beyond the mass of the building, giving them a light, uh, just a second, I have to remove something, a light screen-like um, appearance. In plan, the building operates roughly in a U shape as the frontal incision extends into a central courtyard that focuses the building circulation. The living units are scattered around this hollow core within a torqued grid system that mirrors the geome geometries of the site. A false but implied symmetry, this is very interesting again, a false but implied symmetry is achieved across the courtyard on all the floors except for the ground floor where an unexpected set of organic curves dominates the lobby and disrupts the order of the entrance route. And here you see the plan, the, the plans, very interesting too. You know, the freedom on the, on the ground floor and then the, the certain uh, symmetrical determinism at the top, but on, 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 the, on the typical floor, above but still um, uh, is this uh, kind of betrayed symmetry you know uh, slightly slightly asymmetrical symmetry that makes the building uh, unsettling and uh, in a way lyrical very interesting the most definite defining features of the building are the many slight distortions that's what i try to say the slight distortions moretti makes to the building symmetry and balance such as the broken pediment atop the entrance that doesn't quite align and the slightly off axis entrance stair. Deliberately undecidable elements like these, as Peter Eisenman calls them, are what makes Il Girasole impossible to cleanly categorize into historical and doctrinal context. One of the earliest critiques of the project published in 1953 Describe the project as an eclectic design, but one that could still be understood in modernist terms. However, 60 years of keen sight suggest that the building borrows language from its modernist predecessors, built but in uh, breaking free of the modernist of the modernist uh, box and reinventing. Uh, this exasperates me. Something that I have to remove and. <laughs> I, 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 I feel like exploding. It's, it's, I have a tab here, which you do not see, which covered the text, and I cannot read it, and I cannot remove it. It's, it's unacceptable. Uh, Zoom is, uh, needs some improvements. It's tab here, I, I cannot remove it. It's, it's blocking the view. Sorry about this uh, imperfection. This is the building, as you can see. Uh, but you read the text because you were able to see it. But I, I was I unable to see it uh, at the bottom. You see the building, the uneasy asymmetry and the uneasy symmetry. It's symmetrical, but not perfectly symmetrical. And this is exactly like uh, on our round face or our or our round body. This. Uh, slightly betray symmetry with the, the slight distortions. This shows a great uh, shows great uh, sensitivity and subtlety. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to read uh, any longer because it exasperates me this. Uh, I have to solve this uh, deficiency uh, that I, I'm, I'm fighting against every day with this uh, crazy tab that doesn't I cannot, I cannot remove. It comes back automatically in the very same place. Maybe something wrong with, 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 uh, with my laptop. It's possible. Um, a side view of the building. God, so much writing now that I said I cannot read. I refuse to read. And then details, uh, you know, uh, again, you know, just like in the case of Michelucci, here we see tectonics in the hands of a different architect, uh, unafraid to assume the viscerality of matter. 
I love this, you know. Uh, I mean, on the right, we see, you know, the traces of geometry, regular as it is. I mean, even if he doesn't use only rectangularity, but then on the left, something else, and, and, and then he crafts uh, some negotiation between the two. You know, uh, why not? And then the interior, I think, is excellent. Truly, it is. Uh, in the modernist uh, tradition of, 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 you know, those years, mid-century, uh, even a little bit earlier. So this was been, well, in 1948 or so, immediately after the war. But there are subtleties here that do not show the, the terrible drama that the war um, uh, plunged to the mind of the architect in general. Yes, yes, I, I, I think these words are appropriate, the sublime mastery of nuance and ambiguity. Exactly based on those, uh, you know, subtle uh, distortions and those negotiations, uh, discrete as they are between symmetry and asymmetry. Anyway, if you are interested in the building, you can uh, you can uh, you can find out much more about it than uh, than uh, uh, I was able to evoke here. But uh, this this building, yes, does deserve. Uh, does deserve attention and as i said it's, it's present in any history of modern architecture almost any now again i cannot uh, uh, it exasperates me i don't know what to do about this step um, now is this the way he designed it it is it, it's if he did is incredible no i mean this surface is smooth and this one is rough, very rough and raw. Unusual also this wall here, you know, suspended as it is, it's, it's, it's a, uh, like a mask in a way and behind it, um, the building happens that it was uh, planned. Yes, architecture is an art and you, you need to have uh, this understanding of what architecture is in its essence in, 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 in order to be able to talk emotionally and with such subtleties about, uh, you know, symmetry, asymmetry, this is not the language of science, this is the language almost of psychology, of philosophy, of art. Because as opposed to a scientist, the architect works with emotions or works with emotions as well. Those emotions cannot be, you know, uh, relegated to the gutter. They are real, and they exist, and they should be acknowledged. Anyway, this is the plan of the typical floor and that, uh, you know, mask um, facade that I mentioned must be here. And it's interesting, this cut, this rift into the main elevation in order to enter between the two sides of the building. It's almost like a bipolar building which could have interesting uh, psychological connotations as well. And then undisturbed, he, he you know, employs such um, accidental deviations from the system. Nice, which shows clearly even capriciousness is not uh, to be removed totally from architecture. You, you cannot totally remove the subjective side of architecture. We need subjectivity in architecture as well. Uh, I don't know, these drawings are done by someone else, this uh, Ruggero, Ruggero Lynch in 1981, 97. 
of this building. It's a famous building, yes, by Luigi Moretti. I accelerate a little bit because I'm afraid I am uh, approaching. I'm not taking the plane, but I would still like, if possible, to around 7.30 to leave. Luigi Moretti, Rome. This is in Roma, in Rome. Another house, 1948-1950, if we had to call it a house, and that's how it is called, Casa Albergo, but it's actually a, a tall building. Where is it? In Milan, Milano block of flats or some kind of albergo hostel or something. Quite modern and with a rift on the narrow facade as well. Maybe for students or something. A dorm of some sort. Cartiere Residenziale, Watergate, Washington. This is a very different kind of work which he did in Washington DC in the United States. It's a huge complex adapted, I guess, to the scale of the new country, the brave new world. I'm not sure I, I admire so much uh, this um, opulent uh, uh, body of work, but still creative. Um, I don't know. Anyway, Washington DC, uh, Luigi Moretti. I hope I have here a house, uh, uh, a private house, which has uh, some interesting parts. Le le let's, let's move forward and let's see if it's still here. This kind of uh, project is, uh, you know, uh, they, 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 this is a housing for uh, uh, not for the underprivileged, the, you know, it's uh, opulent uh, housing development and uh, with, um, you know, swimming pools and all the rest with, you know, a rich complex. I don't know how he got this commission. He, he never be like this, something like this in Europe, but he got it. And at the same time, uh, at that time, as you can see, it was still snowing. In Bucharest, we only have three seasons now. Winter disappeared completely. Today we had 16 degrees, almost 18 degrees in January. It's unbelievable. You can almost go to the swimming pool, uh, you know, in, in January because there is no snow, there is no winter. Unexpected this work really in the United States by Luigi Moretti. It almost infuriates me. It's not bad, it's good, but it's, I don't know. Edifici Serelaes or whatever, Eur, 1962. Uh, some institutional building in Rome again, Eur. Another complex of buildings, uh, housing in Milan. This is interesting though, this all of a sudden uh, Luigi Moretti comes back to be becoming interesting. Um, an interesting, uh, you know, can deliver the portion of the building uh, and uh, even the plan, you know, it's, it's, it's creative. It's, and it's in an urban context, an existing urban context, which require creativity, of course, it's not bad. Maybe a little bit heavy, but uh, in this portion, Luigi Moretti, Milan. Block of flats and the rift again, like we saw in that building in Rome, which is his most subtle uh, building actually of all buildings he built, other works. Uh, another, I don't know where it is, another apartment building somewhere, not very big. 
But this one also with some ambiguities and ambiguities sometimes can bring poet poetic meaning to, to architecture. The Tower of Change, Montreal, what an ambitious title. Now, <laughs> I don't know if it, why it's called the Tower of Change, but the tower it is, no doubt. Montreal, Canada. We had seen, we had seen skyscrapers like this one a lot. But it's elegant, yes. But Church of the Concilio Sancta Maria Mater. This is a, a, a project, uh, very interesting, very organic. You wouldn't expect this kind of work from Luigi Moretti, but it shows uh, his complexity and his uh, restless spirit. Too bad it was not built. But look at the model. Imagine this church was built. I regret it was not built. I love this picture, you know, it's, this is what a building dedicated to faith should look like in inside, you know. Lyrical, fluid, mysterious, dark, light. I don't know what this is, but it's, it's, it still looks good. It's a model, you know, a fragment of the building or something. He was an artist. There are many works of Roman Baroque sculpture from the time of Bernini and his apprentices and of Borromini that are in particular areas result in purely formal terms. That's what he wrote because he also wrote and architects are supposed to express them, their thoughts also through, through poetical texts or the theoretical texts. They are so far uh, from any direct reference to objective reality that it seems justified to recognize them as belonging to a formal abstract world. He refers to Bernini and Borromini. These particular areas of plasticity correspond with figural pretexts such as drapery, wings, rocky landscapes, cliffs, tufts of greenery, rays of light and clouds. They are not, they are not of casual or secondary importance with respect to the work of which they belong. They often cover almost the entire surface of the work and constitute the, <laughs> sorry, the text uh, was arrested there. Maybe it was written on behind this uh, maddening tab that I look at my, anyway, this might be, I don't know if it's the last work I show, but it's a very interesting villa he designed and particularly the one aspect of it uh, I like very much. So Villa La Saracena, it, it's very, it's like a small fortress, like a citadel, you know, it's not the typical uh, old glass, it's quite the opposite, it's very opaque, you know, solid walls, uh, very monumental, yeah, like a fortress, like a citadel. Now it looks like the building was abandoned or something. I don't know what's going on here. Can you imagine such a building by Luigi Moretti be, being abandoned? Yes, I guess we can imagine. Villa La Califa. Uh, very unusual buildings really uh, and unexpected. Luigi Moretti exercises, exercises in opacity. Well, I imagine there is a, a much more glass towards the sea, but towards the street or towards the public space is like a misanthropic blank wall with a, with a door in it and nothing else. It, it literally turns its back on, on, on society, on the road and it opens up exclusively towards the sea and the sky. Structures and sequences. Here we see um, some of his pre-parametric uh, studies. 
which are very interesting, I think, you know, I mean, I don't know exactly, I mean, he based himself or maybe he proposed some kind of a new Baroque architecture. Uh, how he arrived at this, I don't know, because it didn't work digitally. But I find them, uh, with, even without knowing them in, you know, uh, thoroughly uh, engaging, uh, interesting. Maybe that's why he's considered the inventor of parametrics because of such studies that he did in his uh, laboratory. But in the absence of knowing the text and reading it, it's, it's hard to know what exactly he did here. Strutture sequenze di spazi uh, di Luigi Moretti. Maybe this is like the plan of a church, no? It kind of looks like something like this. I mean, the model of a, of a church seen from above. Parametric architecture before parametry. Luigi Moretti. What do we see here? We see the result of having passion for architecture. It's nothing else. If you love architecture, if you have passion for architecture, then nothing can stop you. And you can do all kinds of research, all kinds of uh, you know studies, all kinds of experiments. The day after, after all has 24 hours. You can sleep less, eat less, and work more, and, in, and play more. Maybe this is the last image of this imperfect uh, presentation. Yes, it is. So let's wish happy birthday to Giovanni Michelucci and Luigi Moretti. And um, let's meet them again because, uh, you know, uh, we'll talk about them twice during a year when they were born, like today, and when they died. Thank you.